Hello, and welcome to Continual, the never-ending convention. My name is Jean Marie Ward, and we've got a special treat for you today. A panel called Mixology, Toasting the New, featuring the people you know and love from that wonderful dumpling show, Barbara Haynes, Malcolm Jin, and Jennifer Rudd. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about how we celebrate the end of the most challenging year many of us can remember and look forward to a better 2021. And to do that, I've, I've brought the team back and I'm going to let them introduce themselves for those of you who missed uh, Indisputable Signs of Intelligent Life dumplings and let them tell you a bit about themselves, and then we'll get on to the stuff you're really here for, the alcohol. I know this. I'm a writer. Okay. Take it away, folks. Hi, my name is Jennifer Rudd. I am a chef instructor at City College of San Francisco, um, and this is, this is like Team Food Geek or Geek Food Team. So we're here today to show you a nice range of options for the new year. Um, Malcolm. Uh, I am an amateur mixologist, but I have lots of geeky ideas, and <laughs> I'd love to bring them to you here. And mm -hmm. our ringer, I I'm Barbara Haynes, and uh, I teach people about wine and food and wine and food together, and I, uh, I drink a lot. like <laughs> 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 incredibly well regarded here in the Bay Area for her knowledge not only of food but of, of alcohol and I've had more than one person tell me she's got the best palate of anyone they've ever met so she she's got all the all the good information do you want to start us out and talk about bubbles sure we love bubbles all right we're going to turn it over to Barbara and start with bubbles that works all right so I uh, I love bubbles uh, we're talking about celebrating the new year but personally I would drink bubbles every day. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. always something to celebrate. So I selected some wines from very reasonably priced to very expensive for you uh, as recommendations for what might be good on New Year's Eve. If you like beer with food, try sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Why am I not saying try champagne? I'm not saying try champagne because all champagne is sparkling wine. But not all sparkling wine is champagne. The French are very fussy. Champagne comes from a region in northeastern France. And people, uh, the French are fussy, and they don't want us to mention the word champagne unless we're pouring their wine. <laughs> they are very particular. Okay. Um, I, I want to get into that a little bit. Um, I know that Prosecco... The Italian version of sparkling wine is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, champagne is something else. And then there are a lot of things that say they are made in the traditional method and imply they're sort of kind of like champagne. Could you give us a quick rundown of what those differences are? And then please, please show me. I, I want to know. I, I confess I'm broke. What's the cheap version? So, could you? <laughs> uh, again, we call it sparkling wine. Huge category. Every country that makes wine makes sparkling wine. Uh, all different names, but there are a couple of different ways that the wine is made. And Prosecco, which is a very popular and delicious uh, wine, is made differently than Champagne. And so, it's instead of being aged in the bottle, it's aged in a tank and then put in the bottle 
-hmm. there's great, great Prosecco, um, and there's less great Prosecco. So, uh, and you could be like me, I will be raising a glass by myself, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I probably will go for something that's less expensive rather than more expensive, but I want it to be delicious. So, yes. Actually, um, the first wine that I'm recommending is a Prosecco. If you want to go budget, uh, let's see if I can get this. Does this work? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, Prosecco from Asolo in uh, in the Prosecco, uh, the region of Fran oh, France. <laughs> Italy. <laughs> Italy. Um, That's so similar, yeah. <laughs> you can only be labeled as Prosecco if it comes from uh, northern, uh, northeastern Italy. And this is from Asolo, is the place it comes from. And this mm -hmm. is almost half the price, it's under $10, mm -hmm. of some of the best selling Proseccos that are just over $10. And it's absolutely delicious. So this is my budget recommendation. And what then, does it taste like? Is it sweet? Is it hard and dry and flinty? It's because not, it's it's, uh, it's it's dry, but it's also generous, and mm -hmm. it tastes uh, lush and generous, and it's not flinty at all. It's mm -hmm. just um, got a little bit of bitter almond in the finish. Uh, and the bubbles, because it's aged in a tank and not in the bottle, the bubbles are a little softer. Mm -hmm. It has less pressure than champagne. So mm -hmm. it's a little softer than a champagne would be or something made in the traditional method. Okay, because I confess, I'm not a brood girl. <laughs> so you might like this. Yeah. So, okay, that sounds, and that I take it it's a good mixer too if you're making a champagne cocktail like a poinsettia or. Or for New Year's uh, Day, you can make a mimosa with it. Oh, that's, I'm cool with that. Yeah. So, cool. Okay, and what's the, what are your, what's your next up the list recommendation? So, uh, I've got recommendations for more expensive and better, you know, finer Prosecco. But what I'd like to do is go on to the sparkling wines that are made like champagne, but they're from other places. Okay. We can put your additional recommendations either in the credits or in, uh, uh, in the comments. So let's go on with the sparkling wines. So the next one I want to recommend is um, a cava. It's from Spain. Uh, and cava is made just like champagne. It's aged, it gets its second aging in the bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, and cava is about often half the price of champagne. And a good cava is a delicious thing. And I, if I have, uh, here I'm pouring the uh, budget cava, again, mm -hmm. right around $10, mm -hmm. and, but delicious. What is? There's nothing better. What is the name of that wine? Segura and this is Segura Vitas Cava. And Cava is uh, not a place. It's, it just designates on the bottle the way the wine is made, meaning in the traditional method, the way ah. the wine is made. It's and so it's, it, it, is, it gets its bubbles in the bottle, not in the tank. Right. So the first... Uh, the first fermentation of the grapes happened. The base wine is made, if you want to call it that. And then mm -hmm. it's put in a bottle. Um, and a secondary fermentation takes place, which is where the bubbles come in. And that happens actually for longer in cava than it does in non-vintage champagne. So there's vintage and non-vintage. And non-vintage in champagne and in sparkling wine, it's to, it's to have a house style. Mm -hmm. Every year, if you buy Segura Vitas or if you buy uh, Moet and Chandon or whatever you buy of these bigger producers, it's going to taste about the same because they're going to blend from several years. Mm -hmm. and so Segura Vitas Cava, delicious. Um, this is going to be nice. This is nice and dry. This might be too dry for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
what's good about it is it's as good with alone, just mm -hmm. a toast, or yes. seafood, some oysters, or some, um, if you can spring for it, some caviar. Ooh, yes. Whatever you're having for your uh, New Year's dinner, right? Mm -hmm. This is just for toasting, but you could use it for toasting. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are some great kavas. Raventos is my absolute favorite kava. And it, their non-vintage is in the $25 range, but their vintage goes up in the 50 to 75 and even higher range. So mm -hmm. Raventos is a really great, uh, if you have the money and you want to have truly a delicious wine, Raventos uh, is good. But Segrevitas is fine any time. Right. Um, let's talk about America. Since okay. And since uh, we have lots to celebrate, uh, American sparkling wine has to be called sparkling wine, but actually... You will sometimes see American lit bottles labeled champagne because America didn't sign the treaty with France. Ah. But anyone who makes good sparkling wine, quality, I'll say, they call it sparkling wine. So my absolute favorite American sparkling wine is Rotorer Estate. Ah. And this one mm -hmm. comes from Mendocino County in mm -hmm. Valley, and this is a Brut Rosé. So this is a rosé wine mm -hmm. made with Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. and, and Rotor Estate is my favorite because it's dry, and yet this has so much depth. You could think if you closed your eyes that you were having a red wine. And it actually has a teeny bit of still Pinot Noir added to it to give it even more depth. That so, sounds... I love Pinot. I, I really do. So that sounds like something I would really like to drink on New Year's Eve. Uh, so Pinot Noir is one of the three main grapes in, in French sparkling wine. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. Mm -hmm. Probably not a great, most people are familiar with. But this is really um, a crowd pleaser as good with, I love this with Chinese food. So if I were having those dumplings, I'd be having some Brut Rosé. People always say they want beer with Chinese food. Yeah, why not have some sparkling wine of some sort? And this is always my first choice because it's dry and it, you, you almost think you're having champagne, something from champagne because, the, because it's so dry but so full of flavor. And it's made, it's so well made. Most of our wines in, Northern California, it's much warmer than in Champagne, so they mm -hmm. taste fruitier and kind of bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a very well-balanced, restrained, and delicious wine that I can't say enough about. My big favorite. All right, let's go, let's quickly go to uh, Champagne. Now Champagne, if we go to France, when we have Champagne, we're gonna have to spend a fair amount of money. There's just no two ways about it. Um, I have to say Costco has its own brand of champagne that's not very expensive uh, and it's pretty good. I've had it. But if you're celebrating New Year's Eve, maybe you want to go uh, just one step up. And you have basically two choices. You can buy something from the big guys. Here, for example, is uh, a non-vintage Moët et Chandon Imperial. Mm -hmm. And they don't own vineyards. They buy wine from many other people. And you can tell the secret code is on every bottle that tells you, have they grown the grapes themselves and made the wine themselves? Or have they bought the grapes and then made the wine? Mm -hmm. Now, they've been buying those grapes for many years. Here's uh, some of my little toys here. This is from Paul Berger, another one of the big houses. They're called the big the big houses. Um, they've been in business since 1849. Uh, some of them have been in business since the 1700s. And so they know what they're doing and they make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bottles of champagne. Mm -hmm. The other alternative is what we call grower champagne. And that, these people make more in a day 
that a grower champagne makes in a year. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, maybe a trade book as opposed to your, your magnum opus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can decide, and you, or, but it, you know the secret code now. So if it's a grower champagne, it says RM on the label. Mm -hmm. It means that they picked and made the champagne as opposed to just buying the grapes and making the champagne. So RM means uh, récoltant, manipulant, and the uh, big guys, like Moet, they are a négociant manipulant. So you can find the code. Here, for example, is the NM, you will see, if I can find it. Small, you have to put your glasses on. Can you see it? You see it? Uh, sort of, kind of, but yeah. <laughs> now it's a little too close, but I think we can actually use a photograph so that you don't have to see me peering so deeply at the um, at the screen. Anyway, so go to your, you know, uh, just like with books, I like to recommend that people go to their local independent uh, wine shop, mm -hmm. right? Um, and get wine and ask them for a grower champagne if you want to try something really unique. And whereas the big guys, um, big guys aren't bad, they make some of the best high-end champagnes in their vintage champagnes, but um, try a grower champagne, you'll get something that speaks of the place and of the vintage in a very different way than if you have a Moet or a Veuve Clicquot or something like that in non-vintage. If you have vintage, so I recommended La Salle, which is a grower champagne at the minor splurge, splurge level. And then uh, Bollinger, uh, Grand Anne, 2008 or 2012, a vintage champagne at the major splurge level. You sold that book? Okay. It's gonna be a screenplay? Okay. Okay, so minor splurge. Um, it's somewhere 50, 60 ish dollars, depending where you live. And then uh, May, Bollinger Grand Marnier, which they call them Tete de Cuvée, so it's their top um, champagne. Mm -hmm. um, that is probably about $175 a bottle. So the difference between selling your book and selling it to a major studio. That's it. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I hope that there will be viewers out there who can who can say that they're on the uh, selling it to a major studio. But I'd like to raise a glass to all the folks who just who who sold their books and other uh, productions this year because, dang, it was challenging. It was challenging. So one thing we wanted to talk about is how do you properly open this so that you don't lose all your sparkling wine. Yes, that was going to be my next question. What is the trick to opening it without breaking a window? Okay, that's great. So, sparkling wine. So, champagne and traditional method wines have more pressure in, their, in the bottle than a car tire. That's a Whoa. lot. That's window breaking. Yes. So you have to be, and, or putting out someone else. So, you want to be careful. And one of the main things, so Malcolm's going to help me. He's going to open this bottle. So upper body strength is an important component here. Yeah, you basically that you take off the foil, right? You take off the foil. And untwist the little wire cap. Yeah, this is called the cage. The cage, okay. Yeah, so if you operate on the table right there, people won't be able to see but you. You can't. You have to keep it always at 45-degree at at angle because gas goes straight up, mm -hmm. right? So if you keep your bottle at 45-degree angle... You're going to get that pressure and hitting the ceiling with the force of a gunshot. Right. And the other thing is, you know, we all learn from movies or TV that you're supposed to... The bigger the pop, the better. Not true. You don't want mm -hmm. that. Your bottle should be very, very cold. This is mm -hmm. one. It's really important to have it be cold. And then the cage, you want to take it. 
the cage, can you see that? Yes. Uh, every cage on these kinds of bottles has takes six turns to open it. So you pull it back and turn it six times. I didn't realize there were six turns. I just would turn until it opened. Five, six. Did that do it? Yep. Yeah, six turns. And at that moment, from that moment on, your finger never leaves the top because it could just fly off. Okay. Right? And That's so now we- pointed at a plate glass window right now. Right. So <laughs> one thing we want to do also mostly is we put a big towel or a big napkin over it. I've got a little one just so that you can see better, right? Some people take the cage off at that point. I don't. You don't need to. You just kind of get some room here, put your finger on it. And then the key is not to turn the cork, it's to turn the bottle. Oh, and you turn the bottle clockwise or anti-clockwise? It doesn't matter. It's, so turn okay. the bottle, and then as you're doing that, you're almost pushing the cork. Okay, you're almost pushing the cork back in. Right. Right? Because you don't want it to go flying. Can you do it without the thing on? Do you want to take the cage off? Will that be easier? Cage off. Okay. So just turn the bottle. You have to break a seal sometimes. I feel the cork is moving. Okay. So turn it one way and then the other. So there you go. Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. So we opened it and we didn't lose any. Yes. Everybody's got two, four, six eyes still. So <laughs> yes. You retained the cork. You retained yes. the cork. What glass do we want? This is when I was a young, this coupe was what people used. The, the urban myth was that it was based on uh, a certain anatomical part of Marie Antoinette, but that's mm -hmm. urban legend only. Uh, and in some ways, it's not a great way to serve Champagne or sparkling wine? No, um, because what we really love is the bottom are the bubbles, right? So we want to pour slowly, so we really get to make sure your glass is nice and clean, and then we pour that. Mm -hmm. And if we have to wait, and then pour slowly, slowly till we get just enough. Yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. Malcolm. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Now, people, you know, you can use stemless flutes. Malcolm's favorite. Um, some people use wine like. glasses. A white okay. wine glass is really great because you can smell more, but a flute is great because you get to see the bubbles. You can see, perhaps, be over there, that they're bigger than champagne bubbles. Ah, okay. That's because there's actually less pressure. And so the bubbles are bigger. As there's more pressure, the bubbles get smaller. And as the wine, good wine, Prosecco doesn't age. You don't have 20-year-old Prosecco, but you do have 20, 30-year-old Champagne. I once drank a, I once drank a 25-year-old Veuve Clicquot. It's one of my treasured memories. Yeah. It was a grand cru. You remember what was so great about it? It was like... Uh, you had all the sharpness, the, the, the brightness, I think is the word, and the bubbles still, but you had this wonderful undertone of toasted almonds and vanilla. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, it was more like, a just, it was, without being sweet, it was like a dessert, and all of those um, aromas of the various fragrances for it were like concentrated mm -hmm. in the wine. It, um, fortunately, it was before, you know, it was a vintage, it was a Grand Cru, and those things do last longer than most champagnes. But yeah, mm -hmm. the, the intensity of it, as opposed to the, bright, the brightness of, say, a Prosecco, where you're basically splashing this wonderful citrusy thing across your palate, as opposed to, I guess it's the difference between a um, filet de joie, de joie and a grand dame. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who has, 
you know, just is new, is young, very, and someone who has a lifetime of experience and knowledge, and that seemed to be in the glass. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. And that happens because of the chemical changes called autolysis that take place as the wine stays ages longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And you get this toasty, as you said, yeasty, bready, brioche, things, all these other characteristics that you don't get in Prosecco or in most cases in uh, non-vintage uh, method, traditional method wines. Mm -hmm. So um, now it could be that you love you love wine, but you don't feel like drinking. Um, yeah. Hey, so, a lot of people uh, cannot drink for health reasons or other reasons, and we really do want to have everybody celebrate because we're here to toast the new. We're here to to lend our our voices to raise the glass to whatever power you believe in for better times ahead. So, however you can't really do this if your heart isn't in it and to that end i've had, i i know you have prepared a selection of things for a people who don't necessarily like champagne or like the bubbles but not the taste and b for the folks who uh for whatever reason just don't like alcohol and that's totally valid and i understand that jen has got something that is very seasonal, but rather unusual lined up for us. I do. I have a nice um, uh, cranberry, spiced cranberry syrup that I've created for us. And this is fantastic because you can use it as a non-alcoholic mixer to make something super festive. Um, but just a little on the slide, you can also use it to make that delicious mimosa um, on New Year's Eve. So it works really well with sparkling wine as well as sparkling water. So what we're doing is we're going to start with some pure cranberry juice. And this is 100% pure cranberry juice as opposed to cranberry cocktail, which has water and sugar in it and it's much lighter. You really want some intense flavor. So you start with that. And I've got the recipe and that will get posted in the notes. But I'm starting with just a quart of it. And then I like this even just in plain water. So I just make a quart of it and I throw it in my fridge and hang on to it for the season. We're going to add a fair amount of sugar because we're not going to use very much. We're going to make a really concentrated um, syrup. So we'll start with four cups of this and then we're going to add our sugar. And then for spices, what I have is I've got some cinnamon and I have some allspice berries here, which is a dry um, spice. And then I've got some bay leaves and I've got some rosemary. And the, um, the amounts will be posted. And all you do is you put that all together in a pot and you simmer to reduce it. And once it's reduced down um, to about three cups, you're just gonna taste it. And you can taste as you go. And if the cinnamon is strong enough for you, go ahead and take it out. If you want the flavor stronger, once the, the cranberry strength is strong enough, you can just turn off the heat and allow those spices to keep steeping in there. And then to put together the cocktail, it's completely easy. And so I usually do this in about a one to four ratio. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure out my syrup and I'm gonna measure out a little more than an ounce. Just gonna throw a little bit of ice in there. Mm -hmm. We're gonna add our syrup, which is a glorious ruby deep color. Oh, could you raise that to the, to the oh, uh, camera? Absolutely. Oh yeah, I yeah. like that color. So that I'm says holiday. Sparkling water. This I made this so it's not too sweet, even though there it feels like there might be a lot of sugar. When you taste it, you'll see the cranberry is strong enough that there's not. It's not too sweet, but mm -hmm. also this is great for adults. But then if you want to make something a little sweeter, you can use ginger ale or you mm -hmm. can use a lemon lime soda like Sprite and combine that and then what you do is you have this beautiful sparkling cocktail mm -hmm. mocktail um and then i always think it's fun to kind of gussy stuff up a little bit so i've got some sparkling cranberries that are on a pick that can just rest here 
And what we've got is a beautiful little cocktail. If you don't want to do the cranberries, or if you want to, you know, gild the lily a little bit, you can throw the rosemary in there as well. And you have a really beautiful festive looking cocktail. Um, I keep saying this is fresh much. rosemary, right? Fresh, fresh rosemary. rosemary. And you can certainly use your, your uh, champagne flutes for this as well. If you want to go ahead and treat this just as you would um, for using um, some sparkling wine in it, just go ahead and serve it in flutes as well. And that makes it really fun. Um, and as I said, I make the syrup and then it just holds in the refrigerator perfectly. So I just put it back in the, in the container that the cranberry juice came from. Mm -hmm. And then I just have it on hand because I think it's kind of about self care these days, right? Mm -hmm. And treating yourselves well. And so if I'm having my typical, you know, container of sparkling water, I take that second to pour it into a glass, maybe add a little syrup or something else to kind of gussy it up a little bit and just make mm -hmm. it feel a little more festive just for my daily water. Yeah, but hey, it works for me and I love the color. I mean, it just makes me smile looking at it nice. uh, sitting uh, there on the table. And, you know, if we've got some time at the end, could you tell us how to make those uh, cranberries, uh, the sparkling cranberries? Absolutely. It's a, um, I can tell you the recipe comes from a website uh, by Heidi Swanson, and the website is 101cookbooks.com, and I can demonstrate how to make those if we have a few minutes at the end. Okay. Let, let, and as you say, this can also be for an alcoholic uh, content. Can you use, uh, I have seen lately uh, a, pre, a succession of um, syrups available at specialty stores and elsewhere. Can they be used with sparkling water and uh, ginger ale and, uh, you know, lemon lime sodas the same way? They certainly can be. What, what you have to do is you really need to taste them and look at the sugar content. A lot of the commercially available syrups, for my personal taste, tend to run a little too sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you then mix them with ginger ale, you might end up with, or with a, another soda, you might end up with something that's a little too sweet for you. Um, you can counter that a bit with a squeeze of citrus. A squeeze of lime, I think, is particularly nice with cranberry um, or lemon, and that might kind of offset that sweetness for you. Mm -hmm. um, so that would balance it out. What I love about this syrup is it's introducing some of those um, seasonal, both herbs and spices, and I think it's just a little... Um, a little more unusual, and it's so simple to put together. So that's why I kind of like making them myself. I can control the flavor, and I can control the sugar content a lot better. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound that complicated, actually. I was afraid, you know, when you, you volunteered to do this, that, oh, my goodness, this is something that I will just go nodding my head. But it sounds like it's one pot cooking, you know, sugar and and. Yep. And cran and juice and a few spices. Yep, and then just strain out the spices when the flavor is where you want it. And then you, you just got it on hand and um, super flexible. And so we'll make something like this. And then, you know, in our, in our pod, in our circle, some of us drink, some of us don't. Um, if you've got younger kids, you can have this and you can mix it with sparkling wine. You can mix it with sparkling water or soda. Um, and, and everybody can kind of be suited and you all get to feel like you're sharing in that same, the same drink in essence and the same experience. So yeah. it's pretty lovely. Cool. Very cool. I, I, I can think of my younger self and Shirley Temple's. This would have been much better. This is a very fancy. So, so I'm going to turn it over to Malcolm because this is a cold drink and sometimes what you really need is something like really warm but you yes. have a little kick to it and Malcolm has got the perfect solution for that. Oh yes, let's All right, you're up. come on in. Okay. Uh, so I'm here to talk about hot butter brome. Ooh. Um, it's a great holiday drink, a great winter drink, and it's originating from around the 1930s. Uh, there was a movie and a book that popularized it. And it's become a very popular staple for a lot of families and communities since then. We have the kettle on, which is super loud, <laughs> but uh, this cocktail requires hot water. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, let me let me actually start with a, sort of an interesting idea that I came up with while I was preparing for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I need to move you the door. Thank you. All right. All right. So hot buttered rum is a mixture of fat and rum mm -hmm. and some spices and um, hot water. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I have done is prepared some spoons of butter. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, can you see my finger pointing at the? Yeah, I see, I see them. Uh, so that's butter on the spoons. And you've also uh, sprinkled some spices on them, haven't you? Yeah, so the, the one that's, uh, this one here, the plainest looking one is just butter. Mm -hmm. The middle one is butter that's been compounded with uh, speckloose spices. So for the speckloose cookies, which happen to have a very sort of holiday, holiday profile, right? There's cinnamon and nutmeg and And, and so ginger, on. yeah. And then the one on the other end is uh, butter compounded with maple syrup. Uh, and it's very easy to compound butter. You just need to take soft butter and you need to mix in whatever spices or sweeteners that you want to mix in. Mm -hmm. And you mix it until the butter looks uniform. Mm -hmm. And then in order to put them on the spoon, you just sort of scoop it up and you can shape it with even the, like the side of the palm of your hand. Uh, or you don't actually need to make it smooth for the mm -hmm. cocktail. Mm -hmm. So for a classic hot buttered rum, I'm just going to use the butter, and I forgot my sugar. Oh, well, that's okay. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> There's sugar involved, too? Oh, that sounds good. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the easiest one uses spiced rum for the spicing, so you don't have to go out of your way to um, add spices to the compound butter. You don't have to infuse anything. You can just use this is my favorite uh, spice rum. It's called Crocken. It's a little bit fancy, but you can totally use, um, Captain Morgan has a spice rum that's very well regarded. Uh, Gosling's has another one. It's usually a dark rum that's been infused by the, um, the distillery with additional spices that usually have a very holiday feel. So for a good hot buttered rum that's simple, you just need the spiced rum, the butter, the sugar, and the hot water. And you can top it with grated nutmeg. I, don't know so, I, I see but, that's a standard uh, mug. Uh, yeah. how, what are your proportions of sugar, water, and rum? Uh, we know about the butter, it's a spoon. <laughs> the butter in the spoon, by the way, is about one and a half teaspoons, but it can go up to a tablespoon. It really depends on your taste. Uh, beyond that, I use two sugar cubes, mm -hmm. which I believe are about a teaspoon each. I use one and a half to two ounces of rum, really, again, depending on your taste and the people that you're serving it to and what they like. I know that, for instance, my mom would like more, <laughs> but I usually just give her one and a half ounces because she's kind of a light touch as am I, but other people I know prefer two or even more ounces of rum. It really depends. Okay. But it is, since it's a warm drink, uh, it's sort of a different experience with respect to what is too much alcohol because, because it's warm, it sort of volatilizes and it's sort of a different experience when it's strong. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, I guess the, the analogy for me is that sometimes sake, which is a relatively low alcohol beverage, seems to be a lot more powerful when it's warmed. So I'd watch out for that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My sugar cubes gone. They're on the plate in front of you. Oh. <laughs> so for the basic mix, I just add the sugar cubes to the butter, which is still on the spoon in the bottom of the mug. Um, I add just a little bit of hot water to cover the butter and the sugar cubes. And mm -hmm. I'll let it sit. Um, maybe stir a little. Make sure the butter slides off the spoon. Make sure that the sugar is 
melted and dissolved. Mm -hmm. And then I add the rum. So I like these uh, shot measures because you don't have to get down from the side to make sure you've got the right reading. Right. You have to lift it up above your eyes. You can actually, it's hard to see. Um, but the degradations are, the, the gradations are actually inside. Oh, cool. So you can look down into it and still get the right measure. Ooh, that would be a good Christmas present for somebody. Yes. Absolutely. Or an epif or an after Christmas or an a or a uh, other holiday present. Really, any old time. Yeah. Um, I stir again, and then I'll top it off with more hot water. And then the final garnish to the simple version is just a little bit of grated nutmeg. Mm -hmm. We use a microplane. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But. There are also other ways to grate your nutmeg, so. Yeah, uh, I thought about trying to do this in a glass container so we could see how it was coming together, but we don't really have any good heat proof glass containers. Um, the final result is that there's a little slick of butter on the top. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I can see that, yeah. Just like with jams, we can put a pick with a cherry on it. Mm -hmm. We can also use a twist of orange. Mm -hmm. That's the one I've seen most often used with it is citrus, yeah. Right, and then these are gigantic <laughs> for the mug. <laughs> spices, but sort of traditionally you can use maybe a smaller orange slice or even another citrus and you can put it over the rim. Ah. So it really depends on what you like as far as aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and then with the compound butters, uh, it's actually a little simpler because there's less to do. The compound butters can have the nutmeg in them already. Um, the garnishing is the same, the sort of procedure is the same, but you um, you just don't need to track all the sugars. Oh, you want me to talk about that? Okay, so beyond uh, butter-based hot buttered rum, mm -hmm. there is also a tradition of making hot buttered rum batter. And the batter is sort of a premix of all the wonderful rich things that you want to put in the hot butter rum. It's usually kind of deluxe because a batter usually includes some kind of ice cream and butter and maybe <laughs> whipping cream. <laughs> and flour. It's not like a cake batter. Right. But it has it's, the ingredients. It's a sort of premixed soft thing that you scoop into Child. it. You usually make the batter out of some complex mixture of stuff, and then you freeze it, and then when you put the hot butter rum together, it's the batter, the hot water, and a little bit of rum. And it comes out all creamy and warm and nice. So, so it's sort of like instant eggnog. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And we just happened to find, I found this at the grocery store the other day. This is one of our local creamery, Strauss, and it's a chai latte ice cream. Chai spices and ginger. Mm -hmm. and talking about the hot buttered rum and I came home and I was like Malcolm look what I found <laughs> uh, do you want to do one with this yeah sure uh with the maple perhaps I, do we I don't even think we need butter with it or you, you, you want to make a super deluxe how is it going to be hot buttered rum without butter all right make well there's some cream in here <laughs> <Butter>. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm likes, if, if there's deluxe or super deluxe, I'm here to tell you Malcolm will go for super deluxe. I'm going to add, it's it's some thin little pieces of some ice cream in there as well. And then we've got the maple butter in there. And the hot water. And hot water. That would be good. It should be excellent. Should be really good. <laughs> Possible I suggested this one out of my own self-interest. <laughs> Do you have something uh, that we will have for those of us who happen to be lactose intolerant, too? Well, you can put any kind of 
Well, if you're doing the ice cream version, you could use ice. Uh, you could use frozen coconut or um, there's the oat milk base. There's a lot yeah, of different ice base cream bases. Yeah. yeah, they all work. I think mm -hmm. no coconut problem. using coconut oil, like the oh yeah, absolutely. Really hot buttered rum with coconut. You know, the very tropical and yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. So if you've got cold weather, this is a great way to transport yourself to the tropics kind of instantly. I want to show that one. Yes. Well, actually, I want to drink it, but I, I will show it. <laughs> okay. Do your little you don't think there's enough nutmeg in there? Come on, it needs a little nutmeg. <laughs> <laughs> More is better. Yes. So that's the super deluxe, and you can see that this one, so it's got a little foam on top from the ice cream, but yes. as I stir up, you can see it, it actually looks a little creamy. Okay, cool. I'm going to take one for the team and I'm going to have a sip of it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's really nice. And here I'm stuck with tea because I, I have to be sober at the end of the show. And it's, it, it, you definitely get that strong alcohol because of the, the warmth of it. It's not overwhelmingly creamy or dairy. It just adds that little bit of richness that I think is really so delicious. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. And is there more? Well, what do you think? Do you want to do some sparkling cranberries? Do a little Yes, I do. I do believe we need to do some sparkling cranberries. Absolutely. So this is, again, pretty quick and easy. And... I've got my little rig set up here. Okay. So this is, um, as I said, it came from Heidi Swanson at 101 Cookbook. She's a local cookbook author and um, does some really, really lovely stuff. And the only trick to this is you need two different kinds of sugar. The first sugar is you want to find an organic sugar that has slightly bigger crystals. So like a Denimara or something? Not, not to full Demerara, and you don't want sugar in the raw because that's too big. So here I've got regular granulated sugar, and next to it is the organic in the brown bowl. Okay. So very similar, but the organic has slightly larger crystals. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your cranberries, and you're going to make some simple syrup. Hey, Malcolm, how do you make simple syrup? Oh, you, you measure one to one uh, by weight, water and sugar. Yep. And then you warm it a little bit and you mix it until the sugar is all dissolved. So you just, you make that simple syrup one to one, and then you want to take it off the heat once it's, uh, once it's warm and let it cool for just a minute or two. And then you're going to pour it over your cranberries and you don't want it to be really hot. If the simple syrup is too hot, it can pop the cranberries and that's not the point. We just want them to soak in this nice syrup. So you make your simple syrup, soak your cranberries in it overnight. And then um, the next day you're gonna drain them. And then mm -hmm. I'm gonna pop them into the um, organic sugar. Mm -hmm. So can I use dry or do I have to use fresh cranberries? Oh, good point, fresh cranberries. You absolutely wanna use fresh cranberries for this. And then I'm gonna pop them into the organic sugar and just mm -hmm. roll them around. It really, ah. really easy. And then you need to get them out, which is the slightly difficult part. <laughs> I use a fish spatula or a slotted spoon, but I like the fish spatula. And you take them out and you just pop them onto a cooling track so that you get some air circulating around them. If you have right. any clumps of, if you haven't drained them well, you'll get these big clumps of sugar and I just kind of knock those off. And then you just want to let them sit for a few hours because we want that sugar syrup to dry and mm -hmm. let the um, sugar adhere to the cranberries. And then the reason we have that second regular uh, granulated sugar is to fill in any of the gaps and to make it look a little brighter white and a little more sparkly. And so then once they've dried, and these have been drying for a while, I just take them and just give them a quick toss in granulated sugar, and that covers up any of your missing um, or any of the blank spots. And what you end up with is this beautiful sparkly little cranberry. Ah, okay. And it has cool. just enough sugar on it so that you can eat them. They're, they're sweet on the outside and crunchy and then sour and, and, and crisp. 
um, because it is a fresh cranberry. Mm -hmm. um, but these hold fantastically. I've held them for about 24 hours at room temperature in an airtight container. So you can make these ahead of time mm -hmm. and then just keep them on hand. If you put them into the refrigerator, it, they tend to attract some moisture. So they don't hold well in the refrigerator. So I just usually make them the day before I want to use them. Um, they're also fun to put on a cheese board or a charcuterie board. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of dresses things up. And we love to snack on them mixed in with almonds and candied citrus peel and the sparkling cranberries. And we make that as like a little snack mix to have at parties as well. That, was that sounds of something sparkling exactly with a glass of something sparkling so oh. yeah so there you go those are some like quick and easy ideas and now you've got your your bubbles that you can pick out and i think yeah mm -hmm. great if you we're getting near the end of our time is there one piece of recommendation that the three of you would like to offer to our folks at home as to how to celebrate this unique uh, New Year's. Uh, thoughts? What would you suggest? Hi. Well, this is, this is silly because we did a whole panel on dumplings. But for me, the New Year is always best celebrated with dumplings. So I, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the Chinese dumplings that we promoted pretty heavily in that session. <laughs> um, there are lots of different kinds of dumplings from different cultures. And I, and I think that if you want to use dumplings from your culture, that is totally awesome. Mm -hmm. Dumplings, so they, they signify for a lot of people the new year. They signify new beginnings. And it's nice to be able to look forward to that. I think um, my recommendation is we're going to probably have smaller celebrations. You might just be celebrating with the folks in your own home, but that's as good as reason of, as any to still splash out a little bit and treat yourselves well. Mm -hmm. You know, like take that minute. I think a lot of us have been so focused on just sort of the day to day that it's a nice moment to step back and say, what can I do to treat myself nicely? Like what would be a treat for me as opposed, you know, and for my family and for my, my small group and really make it special that way. Okay. And Barbara? And for me, you know, this has been a tough year. And so I think it's really important to just take a minute and remember the things that uh, I'm grateful for, the things, mm -hmm. uh, the people and the things and what it is about this time that's been positive. And so I like to really just take a bit of time, especially this time of year, as we go into looking ahead to something new, um, being able to really start with um, something positive and to remember that, you know, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, there is. And here is to a very good tomorrow. Happy New Year's, uh, Barbara, Jan, Malcolm. And Happy New Year's to you watching this program. May your 2020 be happy, healthy, and prosperous. And if you like this program and any of the others that you see on Continual, please like, share, follow, and subscribe, and leave a review. But most importantly, have a wonderful new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy new year.